Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by the host of the TIFO Football Podcast, Mr. John McKenzie. John, big warm welcome to the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me on. I'm uh, looking forward to talking about all things football and football tactics with you. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I think we were speaking off air before coming on. I mean, I first had the good pleasure of coming across yourself. I reckon it was the summer of 2019 a deep dive into Marcelo Bale. So listening to you on the podcast, All Stats Are Aren't We, a Leeds United podcast. Yeah, those were the days. That was very much my uh, gateway drug to football tactics, the the football of Marcelo Bielsa. Um, and we had the pleasure of covering his football pretty much the whole way through when he was at Leeds. Um, and yeah, it gave me a taste for getting a, a little bit more uh, au fait with tactics and tactical ideas. Um, and yeah, he, that was the starting point and, uh, now moved on to cover a lot more, uh, general tactical uh, ideas, but the, yeah, the starting point for me was definitely Marcelo Bielsa and, uh, getting to know his tactical system really well was a really good benchmark for me to, to then compare it with other systems. And, uh, it's almost like having fluency in a language in order to then be able to become fluent in other languages. Right. So, uh, yeah, thoroughly enjoyed his time at Leeds and, uh, Miss him very much, actually. Yeah, the fascinating impact that he had on the English game, not only the English game, the world game. And I'm sure it's something that we'll speak on or speak to later on. In fact, I mean, that start there at all starts, aren't we? Kind of preceded or preempted what has been a successful career thus far in football analysis, John. But if we were to take it right back to the very start, what would you say would be your earliest football memory? Earliest football memory is uh, definitely watching Leeds when I was growing up. Um, we joined uh, the Leeds fan base from a from a family who aren't particularly um, up with football. So the the first memory I have, I guess, is playing football in the summer of '94 during the World Cup, and we went on holiday with with family friends, um, and were really excited about the Brazil national team at that point as a Brazil team with. Dunga, Bebeto, Janinho and Romario in it. And uh, yeah, just fell in love with with football, I think, at that point. Um, for, for me, I obviously played football before that just as, as a, cas a casual kid. But um, I think for me, that was the first experience I had of football culture. Um, and I think because the friends that I was with were the family friends, my parents... Um, met at Bradford University. We settled down in the area, then moved away. But the family friends were back from back in Bradford, so right next to Leeds. So everyone was Leeds or Bradford, and um, those particular kids were were like, well, if you like football, you like Leeds. So from that point on, I was I was a Leeds fan. Um, a couple of, well, I guess it was only a year later, a year and a half later, uh, Tony Aboa signs for Leeds United, and that was me. I was in. Um, so yeah, that that's my earliest memory is of, of football. Um, and yeah, it's 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 funny how different the, the the game is today from what it was back then. But for me, very much a, a sort of football culture phenomenon. The, the World Cup and then and then Leeds United. I haven't heard of as two contrasting kind of influences <laughs> getting into the game of football as Brazil and Leeds United. It's uh, it's fascinating for me, John, to always kind of unpack the start of one's career, especially when it comes to the football scene. But you could say the move into tactics and what we could say largely now is the Twitter sphere. It was actually preempted by a 10 year career, I believe, in academia, which involved a PhD on the philosophy of subjectivity. Has that shaped how you consume the game of football at all, John? Yeah, I mean, in terms of consuming the game of football, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think it's it, it has influenced the way that I experience the world in general. So, by extension, yes, it has. And I suppose a PhD and the and the concept philosophical concept of subjectivity sounds like one of the most highfalutin ideas possible and sounds as far away as you could get from a football pitch altogether. But the the whole uh, ethos of that that PhD for me was about exploring the concept of what it means to be a human person who ex experiences the world and who comes to terms with living within the world. And there's some really big meaty questions that are asked by philosophers and theologians i was working in a theology faculty about what it means to be to be human that feels i think to most people to be the last 
thing on earth that might be relevant in any way. Uh, but in many respects, it's the it, it's the most fundamental question. Um, and I think I like to think that the things that I learned during my time in academia about what it means to be a human experiencing the world have changed the way that I behave, the way that I think that you should behave in the world, uh, but also how the world, how we engage with the world, how it interacts with us and us with it, which I think definitely influences my um, understanding of how football works. Uh, so a big part of the PhD is is about the the problems that modern philosophy asked or created through asking questions about how we experience the world in certain ways. I don't want to get too bogged down in, in the theory of it, but um, there's a there's a problem which many people, I think, experience through the film The Matrix, right? This idea that what if we're just living in, what if we're just brains in vats experiencing the world, the, the world as, a, as something false, as something that doesn't really exist? Um, and I, in my PhD, I argued that that kind of uh, mindset, that sort of idea that everything we experience could just be an illusion, is the result of certain philosophical presuppositions that that um, are set up, the ways of conceiving what it means to be uh, a human subject experiencing the world and what the nature of reality is like. Um, and I push back on that. And the way that you push back on that is by suggesting that actually embodiment, the, the, the act of having a body, is fundamental to the way that we experience the world. Now, once you start thinking about subjectivity in embodied terms, it becomes very easy actually to move that into the the realm of football. Um, so I've written a few pieces on this actually, but the concept of um, you remember Wayne Rooney scores that overhead kick against Man City for Man United, and there's a, there's a few interviews with him where he's sort of asked, "How is it that you that you did this?" And he he sort of talks about it in a very disembodied way, as though he's almost standing outside of the the situation. And, and sort of observing himself as a body doing that, which is a very modern way of viewing how we engage with the world. Uh, and I've written pieces sort of pushing back against that and saying, actually, a lot of what it is that footballers do in terms of knowledge isn't something that's a sort of stepped back version of, of reality, um, where we're, we're sort of looking at everything that's happening and saying, I'm cognizing it. Actually, a lot of what we do is is embodied knowledge. It's stuff that we... Uh, becomes intrinsic to us. It's stuff that we wouldn't experience if we weren't bodies because we would need a body in order to even have those experiences in the first place. And I think that's really that's a really fundamental aspect of coaching, that what we're actually trying to do is embody knowledge amongst players. Um, so get them to a situation where rather than having to think about what they're doing, simply act it out in their bodies in a very instinctive way. So a lot of my PhD was about the the fact that modernity often likes to remove the body entirely from the discussion about what it means to be a subject. Uh, for me, it was a, that, the opposite counter movement was trying to get the body back into that into that sort of conversation. And the the lesson that I've learned from that um, as a as a football analyst and and as an aspiring coach is that um, a lot of what we are trying to do when it comes to uh, pedagogy, teaching people how to play the game, isn't just about telling the theory of what they're supposed to be doing but also uh, using the embodied aspects of, of football to inform our, um, our teaching methods as well it's, it's fascinating for me there just to hear in the description of Rooney scoring that overhead kick because for me it's like why do you pay your money to go watch the game we pay because we want to see the best players performing and an element of that performance is obviously tied to the team intention but there's something that you pay a that is incalculable, it's off the cuff, it's greater than the sum of their parts, it's players in flow. You could say the best coaching at times indeed is something which is in flow. And this um, this debate over subjectivity in football for me, is it's equally fascinating because I think we've seen it rear its ugly head really and in the form of this position versus relationism debate, which you know, position is very something that is top down as opposed to relationism, which is bottom up. What's your own opinion on it, John? Ooh, I mean, yeah, jumping in with the the small questions from the beginning, I mean, but yeah, look, for me, for me, football is both things, right? Football is, as you've said, top down and and bottom up, and we we look to get the benefit of both of those things, um, both as analysts and coaches. What what I mean by top down is this idea that you can have a coach who can offer 
structural solutions to problems that might occur during the game and and we know that we know that structural solutions are necessary in the modern game uh, because if you don't have those those sorts of structural ideas in the way that you're playing then you're very easy to exploit as a collective but football is also bottom up to use your term which means that actually there's a sense in which the individual can solve problems on their own um we don't need to inform the individual players how to behave in certain in or at least micromanage them in certain scenarios in order for them to offer solutions that can result in in goals as well and for me the the um the entire um reason well, the entire um ethos of a coach should be how do i get the balance right between those two aspects how do i offer structures that are there to help players when they need structural solutions without then um impinging on the on the uh on the individual's p potential to solve problems in the moment as well um so that's the that's the framework i think of that through which i would be viewing or would be wanting to view football now there is a narrative that you've alluded to there which is i think this this concept that um that that begins with this idea that actually in the modern game there's been too much weight given to the structural solutions offered by coaches um uh, in 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 at least at the elite level levels of football and as a result of that and you know you can pick your bogeyman right it's usually pep guardiola and i think there's no surprises that he would be picked as the bogeyman because it turns out his team are very successful um and so you get you, you sort of get a, a couple of things going on one is that um obviously when you're successful other coaches are going to try and copy what you're doing so uh, i think it's fair to say that there's a sense in which you do get a lot of copy paste coaching where coaches try and take the ideas of Pep Guardiola and recreate them in their own team and think, you know, operate with like a one-to-one -one causality where they're like, well, obviously if we get, if we can do, if we can just do what Pep Guardiola is doing in a, in a very sort of rudimentary structural fashion, then we'll win all of our games. And there also, I think maybe a tendency amongst, I want to get the wording on this, right? Cause I don't want to be unfair, but I, I think that there can be a tendency amongst, um, FA coaching pathways and and uh, and qualification uh, pathways as well to produce those kind of coaches, right? Because it's very easy to say, I mean, how do you how do you train a coach? Um, it, it takes years to hone the craft of being a good coach. A lot of it's about interpersonal relations. A lot of it's about learning from your own mistakes. A lot of it's about being thrust into environments where you have to be able to respond uh, often without much. Um, without much preparation you obviously can't teach that through just a, a a coaching course or at least in the the structure and the and the uh, um and the, the way that they're set up at the moment um so i think that again you, you can sometimes uh end up with coaches coming out of these systems with uh, a lot of again copy paste ideas where everyone's doing the same thing i'm actually going through my coaching badges at the moment and it's clear that the english fa um, are aware of this problem um, insofar as I think there's a lot of emphasis now, in, especially in the earlier levels of that of the coaching pathway, to say it's not just about winning. It's about having kids uh, enjoy the sport early on. People play sport for as much for entertainment as to win games as well. So there has to be an element to which our coaching can accept that. So... That's on the one side. I think there's this narrative that actually what happens is that all coaches now have that there's a tendency, to, particularly at the top levels of the game, but it can be seen all the way through to the grassroots level, that um, there's a, this tendency to think about the game in positional terms, which is, as you said before, sort of top down structural solutions to problems. This is the way that you play football. And, and um, there's a supposition then from, a, 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 I think, a, a, an alternative school of thought. Let's call it that. That the solution to that has to be moving back towards, I suppose, destructuralized um, approaches to coaching uh, a little bit more. So, the, uh, yeah, the 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 term that's often used is relationist, um, and the idea there being that rather than the positions that the players take up, the structures that they adopt 
being used to solve problems on the pitch. We can actually use the relations between the players uh, and the players themselves as in, as in individual talented um, footballers to be able to solve those problems. And now I have a number of problems with the way that the debates have been structured so far. Um, but I'm, I'm always wanting to be super clear and caveat this with, I do not consider relation relational ideas to be problematic at all. I think the, the concept of relation within football is, is a really important and fundamental uh, concept, which all coaches should have understanding of, should have uh, an ability to recognize where it can be useful and, and be used and should um, be able to coach their players with those sorts of ideas in mind. Because as I said before, I think coaching isn't just about the top-down solutions, it's also about bottom-up solutions. And often I think that coaches can learn from the solutions that players offer to actually in, in, integrate those kind of ideas into their coaching. So there should be a symbiosis between them. Mm. That said, I think that the way that the narrative has been structured Has been unhelpful because it suggests that there's one way of football which is positional and then there's another way of football which is relational and the one is top down and the other is bottom up and as i said i don't think that that is a helpful way of of uh, structuring the, the relationship between the two of them because i think football is fundamentally both of those things i don't think there's such a thing as a purely positionist football and I don't think there's such a thing as a purely relationist football either. And so by setting up the terms of the debate in a, in oppositional language, and by oppositional, I mean, we have one concept here, which simply cannot coexist with the other one. Um, it has been a problem. And I think the re there's, there's reasons why the debate was structured in that way, the ori original debates. One of them is that I think by making the debate so stark, it makes it quite an attractive concept um, to talk about. So it's like, are you one side or are you the, are you the other? Um, and I think if you throw that into a situation where, as we've said, there can be a tendency for football to become, to become quite stagnant or, or football coaching to have become quite stagnant, um, it then makes a really heady mixture where people are saying, Okay, I've been through the coaching pathways. I understand all of the main elite ways of playing football. Suddenly, we're presented with a different way of playing football, and this is going to revolutionise everything, et cetera, et cetera. So I think the debate was structured that way in order to get some kind of purchase, but I think it was reductive to to posit the terms of the debate um, in, in that way. Now, there's another aspect that I think gets, um, that benefits from that oppositional uh, relationship or structuring the relationship in that oppositional way and that's much more cultural and it's to do with some of the debates around the the spread of the history of ideas basically questions about colonialism the, the spread of the game into south america um concepts of what it means to have a national identity that presents itself in 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 footballing terms and again i think that uh, uh, by stru structuring this debate oppositionally it allowed again a lot more purchase for for that kind of debate to be an us versus them um kind of uh, kind of debate so th that, that was a really long way around answering your question but um I, I suppose that the tldr of that is football has always been positional it's always been relational um we use we can use them in differing degrees we can use them in different phases um those ideas can can pop up in uh yeah you know in in surprising places when we're when we're playing football but if we're using those terms in a, an oppositional manner, uh, we're ignoring the fact that football has always considered, or at least good football, has has always considered both the top down and the bottom up approaches simultaneously. Um, and yeah, th that's sort of my my current position on on the uh, position relation debate. There's no such thing as positionism. There's no such thing as relationism. Um, but position and relation are really important concepts that coaches should have a good understanding of. Thanks for that, John. That's very, very insightful. And I would agree in the fact that you, I don't believe you can decouple one from the other. Um, I think the utility as a coach analyst on looking to these debates, reading these extensive pieces, listening to these podcasts, 
is in its usefulness and practicality. And I think this is something that you pointed to earlier on with your PhD. It's nearly the problem of too much knowledge because there is one question I particularly want to ask yourself and that relates back to you know, the different ways in which you consume a game of football from the professional to naive fandom to the education piece to the coach piece. Are you able to decouple yourself at times? Is that still a healthy relationship? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, look, experiencing the game as, as a, an analyst versus experiencing the game as a fan, I think... I, I consider those to be two completely different categories of ex experiencing a game of, of football. Um, I suppose that, you know, the, the way that I've explained this in the past is that if you say you're a fan of F1, you can watch Formula One without having any understanding of how the internal combustion engine works or about aerodynamics or about the, the, the current uh, technological evolution of, I, I don't know, carbon fiber um and still enjoy the sport right you can watch it you don't need to understand how an engine works to enjoy formula one and the same is true of football you don't need to understand how football works in order to understand football um now i think that it's with football compared to formula one i think there's maybe a, a little bit of a complexity in the analogy because i think everyone who enjoys football likes to think that they understand football and if you spend you know you spend a lot of your life watching hours and hours of football you want to feel as though actually that watching has translated in, in, into understanding and often it does there's a lot of very smart fans out there but for me that they're, they're complete to to analyze a game to watch a game and analyze it and watch a game and just you know let it wash over you are two very different experiences um and i think that i, I make a point of, of separating those two out when i was covering leads for all stats aren't we it was always the case that I would not make a comment about the game until I'd rewatched it again from a more analytical point of view. Um, and that's because, again, we've got those two different orders of knowledge that we were talking about before. There, you know, there are different kinds of knowledge. You can experience uh, a football game in a very visceral way as a fan where you're not really taking anything in, in terms of, you know, what's the opposition structure? What's the, what's our structure? What are we doing in different, phases of play what is the intention of the of the players and the coaches at different moments you can you don't need to understand that in order to enjoy the game so yeah i think um i, I would say that as an analyst um i i am thinking about how's the game working here not not always necessarily doing a great job of it but um i'm definitely experiencing that game very differently to the way that i experience it as a fan and i think there's space for both of them although i do think the more that you analyze, the the harder it is sometimes to be able to relax into that more um, that more enjoyable version of, of of game experience where you are a fan and you just sort of let the game happen around you. It's a very thought provoking answer, and my my caveat to that is that what I find fascinating about football is that it will mean so many different things to us at different stages of our own footballing journey as the kid support in Brazil in the 94 World Cup coming across Leeds United you know but what people very seldom touch upon is there will always be players or teams that shape your worldview of how you perceive the game of football but I'm just thinking John as a coach analyst can you reflect back to any moments and or games for that matter that have shaped your worldview of the game so coaches and games did you say that Apologies, games. Just games. Well, I mean that's a, that's an interesting question because I think I think as an analyst, the learning that I do isn't particularly um like it's not particularly Damascus Road. It's not like I, I watch a game and I think, oh, this has completely changed my my view of what of what is is going on in football. I'd say that it's a it's a much more gradual shift. Um, where you know you 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 what you'll you'll have watched you know half a season of 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 games and then you realize actually I've shifted my position on things a little bit. I mean, a good example of that could be the way that Liverpool are using Trent Alexander Arnold at the moment, which I've been 
maybe critical of in the past, maybe still am a bit critical of it in terms of um, it doesn't really seem to fit the way that I conceive of uh, why you might uh, invert your fullback. Um, but and, and and part of this, I, I guess, is an, an evolution, not just of my own opinions, but of the way that Liverpool have used him in that role. And I think that's maybe what constitutes the evolution that I've gone through, because at first they were trying to invert him in very much the classic positional play um, manner, which is, you know, you, you bring him inside. It gives you a, an extra player in build up and in a sort of pivot role, which should allow you to move the ball more in a more controlled manner through the center of the field. Also gives you a little bit more cover in, in defensive transition, but also like gives you ease of access into the wide areas as well, because with your fullback moving inside, you're probably going to squeeze the opposition's, you know, m m the second line of the press a little bit narrower. So you should, in theory, be able to find your wingers a little bit more easily in, in build up. Now, all of those things are, are true. And, it, you know, some of those things, the reason why I was critical of it in the first place was because it didn't feel as though it made any sense. Because if your fullback isn't offering width, then you have to get your width from somewhere else. So you get that, do you get that from the number eight? which is, to be fair, what Liverpool have done in the past because Liverpool would invert Trent Alexander-Arnold in you know final third phases where you want to get him into the half space to cross cross balls to from that dangerous area and he's just so creative from there. And so what you would usually have is someone like Jordan Henderson shifting out into the wide area when when um, Alexander-Arnold got into, that, into those sorts of places. Um, but when you're doing it deeper in the field suddenly the width has to come from somewhere else. So you either have to move one of your, your eights out wide, and then you're losing a little bit of the control that you might want to get from uh, central build-up, right? Um, if you're losing, you're pushing a midfield, well, pushing a fullback into the midfield area um, and then moving another midfielder out. Obviously, you can get benefits from that, but it does seem to go against the intention of actually a lot of the reasons why teams do that is because they want to form a box midfield which can allow them to overload in the middle and find central progression solutions the other thing you do is use a wide wide forward to, as a as a sort of uh what, what's the what's the word is it sort of, sort of like a ball progressor who's going to sit between um the front line and the and the defensive line and help progress the ball in wide areas there should be a bit more space there as we've already said but when you're wide forward on that side is Mo Salah it seems again you're moving against the intention of what you might want to achieve with the squad, the profile of players that you have, because you're moving him away from the goal, which is where he's dangerous. You're also forcing him to become a, a, a sort of back to back to goal player rather than looking to get in behind as a as a more interior striker kind of player. Um, and so it doesn't make a huge amount of sense um, if you apply the classic logics, but. For whatever reason, it's it's been working for Liverpool, and I think that part of that reason is because his uh, role in that position has changed. He's now being played as much more of I would call it a, uh, I guess a sort of quarterback player, right? Where he's dropping out of the block to receive the ball facing down the field because he doesn't necessarily have the technical ability to receive back to goal inside a block under pressure. That gives him the ability to just receive the ball facing down the field and then use the, the just incredible ball striking that he has to help Liverpool progress the ball down the field. Um, and Liverpool are playing quite a dynamic game at the moment. They're not looking to build slowly and, and patiently through the middle, as we were talking about, as you usually do when you invert your fullback. This is a lot more about direct progressive passing. Um, and he has the skill set to be able to do that. So for whatever reason... Um, the fact that they've used Trent Alexander-Arnold in in a sort of traditional inverted fullback positional play um, as, as, as sort of um, uh, um, variant and it hasn't worked has meant that they've changed that so that it actually suits the way that they want to play as well. Um, now, I still think there are there are sort of structural problems with that and you would think going forward if they wanted to carry on playing that way, they would have to make other changes as well, but it works. And so that that's changed my opinion. Cause I think I went and been like, this is why you do that. If they can't do that well, or to the best of their abilities, what's the point of doing that? When actually what they've done is they've done that. And then they've said, okay, there's better ways for us to do that. Let's evolve the position. Let's make it suit the, the skill set of the player that we have. And because he is just a, an elite, elite generational talent, that position can actually work quite well for him. 
um, in, in ways that I hadn't really expected. Right. So I think that that's, that sort of experience that's i think that's how i would consider the way that i learn um as an analyst it's it's through the realization over a long period of time that i didn't actually appreciate the full ramifications of, of what what's going on uh, if that makes sense it does of course and i think it's something which you alluded to there it's not necessarily what or who for me it's the when moment to speed up the game in terms of liverpool's game model and i think there's never been a more exciting time in football tactics for me in possession when we speak about timing and it's all about the moment and the speed at which these actions are executed. And it's fascinating for me to hear you so eruditely speak of that and someone with Brazil and Bielsa's key cultural influences on your football and beliefs, John, to see the route in which you've gone, I, I would suppose, really the last year or two with your analysis, which is much more focused with uh, the out-of-possession aspects of the game. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. Um, and and to to be honest, the I think the the out of possession interest that I developed, I developed through Bielsa weirdly, um, mainly because no one had really talked about Bielsa's out of possession system, despite the fact it's so unique. Um, and so I think given that we were covering it so much, I was able to do quite a few pieces on his man to man marking um, and raise questions about it as well. I think there's a lot of people who there's a lot of Leeds fans who have ptsd about the the defensive structure that that uh, bielsa used at the end and interestingly enough i notice that at uruguay now he has uh slightly softened his extreme man-to-man -man marking approach but yeah it was it, i as a result of that i sort of focused on the out of possession and became a bit more interested in it and then when i was um yeah, I think the, the the point at which I was doing this in the in the public sphere anyway, there's very few people talking about out of possession ideas. So it was a very obvious niche for me to to start thinking about. So um, yeah, I, that was again Bielsa the gateway drug to to a future um, interest. And I think from there it's it's become apparent to me anyway that um, I went into that niche at the right time because so much of the elite game now is determined by the out of possession phase. I think it used to be in the past that, you know, you could simply have your in-possession approach and you could use that as a one-size-fits-all in-possession approach. Um, and yeah, okay, sometimes you might struggle against certain out-of-possession ideas and you might have to change things up. But the reality is now that what is going on at the highest level in coaching in the, in, in the, elite, uh, in the elite leagues is that coaches are purposefully targeting aspects of um, opponents' out-of-possession shape in order to get attacking upside. And we've got to a point now where that has become so prevalent that coaches will then change up what they're doing in and out of possession in order to try and respond to those changes that are being made. And so certainly at the top level of football, we're seeing very cat and mouse games um, where, where a coach will make a decision, get upside from it, and then the opposition re will respond by changing their out of possession shape in order to stop those uh, uh, those weaknesses from being able to be exploited. We see it happen a few different times. So a good example of that could be the Man City game uh, at the Emirates against Arsenal, where it was a very tetchy game uh, where both sides wanted to block out the middle. Um, Arteta started uh, pressing, uh, pressing out with his fullbacks to make sure there was no... And Arteta was using his fullbacks to jump up onto the free man when he was pressing hard the field when Man City were trying to build out from the back. This caused problems uh, for them structurally. So they switched it up. They started using their wide forwards to cover the free men. And this is what happens in, in modern football now. It's constantly thinking through, this has been the solution to the problem. This has opened up a weakness somewhere else. We have the flexibility in our in-possession structures to be able to exploit that but the opposition have the flexibility in their out of possession system to respond to that as well. So yeah, I think that's, um, I think that sort of summarizes why I think the uh, out of possession phase is so important now. And uh, I would recommend anyone who's going into analysis or coaching in, in the modern day to take out of possession stuff seriously. I think there's been a tendency in the past for people to find it a bit boring. Um, certainly players can find it boring if you're not um, thinking of ways to make the drills 
more ex exciting and interesting. But I think there is a realization now that you can't simply be a really elite in possession player, coach. You have to have the the tools out of possession as well. Fascinating for me. And as an offset of that hybrid pressing, of course, which you've eloquently spoken and written about, has been fascinating for me to see develop and particularly fast forward, I would say, this or this uh, Premier League season. And for me, it's a consequence of more teams being adept at using a plus one in the build-up, be it the goalkeeper. I think there is an awful lot of role clarity that you've seen given to sides if and then knowing the moment when to press, knowing oppositional cover and whatnot. But it's been fascinating to see the difference between the haves and the haves nots, even watching the Bundesliga last weekend. Uh, the first half from RB Leipzig in possession of the ball with Blasvik in goal was an absolute masterclass against Chabi Alonso's press at Leverkusen. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, in terms of hybrid pressing, that's something that I picked up in the last couple of seasons. Um, weirdly, I, I came across hybrid pressing because I started watching Andoni Areola's football at Rio Vallecano. And in many respects, I started watching because we were doing a series at All Stats, aren't we? Being like, who should Leeds get as their next manager should the the need arise? And there's it's easy to make the the same sort of allusions to um, Marcelo Bielsa's football when you're talking about Andonis, coached by Bielsa at Athletic Club. Uh, they have similarly like interesting uh, ideas of of uh, out of possession football. Um, and I would say, yeah, in terms of the in possession stuff, interesting ideas too. But um, I started watching Iriola, um yeah, pretty much as soon as he arrived in the in La Liga. Um, he got Rai Vallecano promoted. Just seeing some really, really interesting things that he was doing. Uh, very refreshing in many respects because I think that there's aspects of what he's doing that are very different to what other coaches are doing, particularly in that context of uh, recently promoted sides who are faced with a tough task of thinking about how do you change your play style from being a team that usually have dominated games to then becoming an underdog in games um and really enjoyed what i was seeing there and one of the things i'd noticed from what he was doing was was the fact that his teams were able to shift between high man-to-man -man presses in certain phases and then drop off into low more structured blocks um and not just that they could do that because i mean obviously you know the theory behind doing that is, isn't that difficult but they had they had the transitional uh, awareness of how to move between those two, uh, those two situations. So, yeah, hybrid pressing is simply a press that attempts to get the benefits of an aggressive high press man to man, whilst trying to avoid the the, the cons that you get from that by moving into a zonal structure further down the field. That that again has offers you pros, but also has cons as well. Which is that if you are going to stay your whole game in in a mid passive block or even a low block you're giving impetus to the opposition to be able to control possession for long stretches of the game as well um so i started exploring that a little bit more started noticing that everyone was doing it in one way or another um and again found a niche that i could write about and um talk a little bit more about the theory of it and i think one of the benefits of being an analyst is that you can talk about the theory because i've no doubt that these sorts of ideas were generated very practically where there's a where there's a realization what about if we push up in these sorts of areas what if we can force the opposition to build up on one side cut off the opposite half of the pitch and then find ourselves in this sort of man-to-man -man structure which can then cause the opposition huge amounts of problem in build up i'm sure it was a, a fairly natural uh, evolution for the coaches arriving in that uh, that place but fortunately i've been able to talk about the theory and, and, and almost document it across a few different teams um in order to be able to, I think, hopefully anyway, um, uh, offer some kind of uh, gain to knowledge by looking at the big picture stuff as well. Interestingly enough, I think that, and this is, again, it shows you how quick the game evolves at the highest level. I think there's a, a couple of teams who have struggled this season. I think you could argue Man City are one of them because now opposition teams have exit strategies to be able to avoid the, the, the difficulty of building up against the high man-to-man -man press when it happens. So we're seeing a lot more flexibility, I think, in build-up 
lots more rotation. So a manager like Andrew Postacoglu, for example, I think offers problems to a um, a hybrid press, a sort of classic hybrid press, because there's so much rotation in their build-up unit that it becomes actually quite hard to manipulate the opposition with your high pressing phase. Um, and so we're starting to see teams realize that, you know, hybrid pressing works really well when oppositions are going to be really structured in their build-up. If you can find ways of causing problems in in your to, to the opposition by by using non-standard structures or rotating around in certain ways, then you can come come some way towards being able to cause problems for that. So I was watching was I watching the other day, I was watching Bologna, um, because everyone's hyping Bologna at, at the moment. Um and yeah, I'm not entirely sure they're completely worth the hype, but one of the interesting things they do is, and we see it with actually Eric Ten Hag's Man United as well, who I think a lot of people would say shouldn't be hyped, but um, pushing centre-backs forward in, in build-up so that they move into the midfield area um, in a way, in such a way as to drag the opposition press around a little bit, um, which is, I think, different to what um, Pep Guardiola is doing with someone like John Stones, um, because I think by the end, by the end of last season, what Man City were doing was they were starting out with John Stones in midfield and then dropping him out out of possession. So it wasn't about pulling the opposition press apart so much as uh, operating with a different structure, a starting structure, which is so interesting because that's not like that's not what we expect to be happening, which is moving a, a player into a non-standard position in possession, actually starting them in the non-standard position in possession, and then moving them out uh, out of possession. If that makes sense. Um, but yeah, that's what we're starting to see happen now, I think, is, is is more creative ways of being able to pull around an opposition high press in such a way that these hybrid presses maybe aren't quite so efficient as they as they were before. So and that's all all of this has happened within the space of two or three seasons that we've gone from here's one way of causing a huge amount of problems for teams to actually this has lost a little bit of its edge because teams now have an understanding of how high presses are designed to cause problems and they have solutions to those problems as well. It's very fascinating. And, you know, as a byproduct of it, you'd nearly be called a sickle to say that you'd enjoy watching teams out of possession, John. But it's uh, I mean, using the adage that the best solution in defence is to attack for me is very pertinent here because... I believe in an awful lot of the football that we've seen this season in particular that we enjoy from the likes of Man City, Tottenham, Girona, Bayer Leverkusen, Leicester. Um, is there an argument to suggest that a lot of these teams see the game as one phase? And for me, that's just judging by their in-possession strategies and out-of-possession, maximising this, minimising, maximising distances when necessary. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think, I think that I mean, I, I don't know if I would say that they they all they they consider the game in 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 a singular phase so much as they recognise that every phase has an equal and opposite inversion, um, and I guess that's where rest defence would come in, right? Because the idea of rest defence for those people who don't know it is this idea that you have to think about your defensive structure when you're in possession of the ball, because you can have the ball turned over and then you will be expected to defend and i think that's the reality that so many of these coaches work in now which is not just rest defense but also rest attack so you defend you you attack in such a way that if you turn the ball over you have solutions to the common problems that can be caused in the way that you turn the ball over um but similarly i think there's a lot of teams on and again this is why i love and donny areola i think that what one of the things that he offers because i think a lot of people would just have him down as an o oh, an out of possession merchant but it's not just about the fact that he has these really nice structures for causing the opposition problems out of possession. It's that he has then solutions of how to attack in when those when those turnovers happen, right? If if you have a repetition in it's the same for the rest defense thing we're talking about. If there's a if you have a repetition in the way that you're likely to give the ball away, then you have to structure your your defense and your rest defense to be able to mitigate those kind of problems. But the same is true that if there's a if there's a repetition in the way that you turn the ball over yourself and win possession back, then you have to have solutions for how you're then going to turn that turnover into a goal scoring opportunity. And I think that's something that Antonio Rollers teams do really well is that it's not just that the focus is on causing 
opposition team's problems out of possession, which is an easy solution when you're a, a team towards the bottom of a table, right? Where you can say, okay, we're not going to be able to compete with them toe to toe if we consider the game simply in terms of it in possession value. Um, we can just cause the problems out of possession and then try and snatch something on the break. Yes, that, but also a realization that that doesn't mean to say that we just, once we've turned the ball over, our work is done. No, that's the beginning of the of the important part then. Um, and I get quite frustrated. At, you know, people do have me down as the sort of out of possession guy a lot of the time because I talk about it a lot, but I've I've always been outspoken in, in my opinion that, that out of possession stuff is always subsidiary to the in possession stuff. You can have the best out of possession st structure in the world. I don't care if it doesn't if it isn't matched up with a a, 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 a functional in possession structure as well, which is in 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 some sense has been my criticism, or it certainly was at the beginning of the season of Arsenal, because they had what I was describing as the best out of possession approach in in world football. I was unashamed in that in, in saying that, but like the problem was is that. You can't simply live off the back of your out of possession system. You have to have in in possession solutions as well. So, yeah, I I I I love talking about out of possession stuff. I largely love talking about it because there's you know there's there's been that massive niche where people haven't talked about it because they sort of think well you know the out of possession stuff is just what you have to do because sometimes you won't have the ball. But yeah, in terms of what your the original question was about. There's a realization that your out of possession is simply the other side of your in possession, and you should have a coherent concept of how those two aspects, those two phases of the game, fit together. So, what you're doing in possession is servicing your out of possession approach, and what you're doing out of possession is servicing your in possession approach as well. So fascinating, and you know, to see the depths of what you've gone into educate general football public about Andoni Iriola. It's just, a, it's just the tip of the surface, but I've heard you in a previous podcast anyways, John, before you speak about not following players or teams necessarily, but coaches. Are there any up-and-coming coaches that are interested in you tactically that we should be keeping an eye on at this moment? Yeah, I mean, you've mentioned the two that I think stand out. One is Mikel at, at Girona, um, and the other is Xabi Alonso by Leverkusen. Um, I think, and I think they stand out because of the context within which they've emerged. But they they both have interesting aspects uh, to them. Um, when it comes to Mikel, but what's so interesting about him is that he has a, a, a sort of storied history of bringing teams up from the Segunda into La Liga and then promptly getting them relegated. Um, and then he's changed everything around this season. Oh, sorry, last season by keeping Girona up when they when they got promoted, but now this season just creating them into an unstoppable force who are taking on everyone in in La Liga and playing just some of the most exciting football that that um, that I've I've watched recently. Um, there's a few elements to that. One of them one of them is clearly that that you know Michelle has realised that you can't just. Um, get your players to, to to defend aggressively the whole time, you will leave yourself wide open if you do that. Um, so I think a, an awareness from him that making that, making that aware, making that himself aware of that fact that as we were talking about before, your out of possession has to service your in possession phases. Um, now, no doubt there's still a learning curve going on there. And I noticed that their defensive record recently has been, um, has been quite wide open, but you know, they're scoring five, to offset conceding three, um, which makes for uh, yeah very very fun football. But um, the other thing that they've done so well is they've just recruited players who offer a lot of solutions in possession. So they play this this really nice system, which ends up being I guess people call it a three one six shape in possession. I'm, I'm not particularly enamoured of labeling possession um, structures in that way because it gives too rigid an account of what's going on because. They just have so many different potential solutions in build up because they have players like Daly Blint at the back who can play as a, you know, you can play him as an outside center back uh, in possession. You can play him as a fullback. Um, and then on the, you know, you've got um, Miguel Gutierrez who, again, you can play him as a, an inverting fullback, but he often drifts up into the into the final line, a sort of very Andrew Postacoglu inverting fullback style of, of player. They have Savio on that side as well. But they, it, it means that they can have a huge amount of flexibility. So there'll be some games where um, they might want to play with Daly Blint as the outside centre-back if they're playing someone who they're worried about in terms of defensive structure. 
Um, I think they did that against Real Madrid in the in the in the first fixture against them this season. Um, but they, they they have the ability to be able to tease apart opposition blocks by having just that those those players have Alex Garcia as well in the middle. Uh, they have players like Ivan Martin. Um, all of these and, and all of these players are being rotated around in service of the the game at hand. So offering solutions, using individuals to cause problems for specific opposition setups. So you can play Savio on either side. You can have Daily Blind almost playing as a as a fullback. You can have Miguel Gutierrez almost playing as an inside forward, or you can have it completely different. Um, and then on the other side, they have Jan Kuto uh, and Eric Eric Garcia as well. Who again? There's a little bit of flexibility there. You could play Garcia as a fullback. You could play Jan Kuto as an, an outside forward, almost um, was a classic winger. And the beauty of it all is that that I think a lot of the time when you get teams like this, there's an over reliance on the same structure over and over again. You know, thinking of like Leicester City when they won the Premier League, you knew what they were doing. You knew which players were going to be in each position. Whereas this is a lot more um, fluid and flexible and Michael is very good at finding those um of those player solutions to to these problems and yeah a lot of people will will point to the city football group links but um recruitment is difficult whoever you are even if you have all of the um of the upside that you can get from being part of that city football group and it's just incredible to see the the fact they can bring in you know players that we've been talking about um like Savio Daly Blin Eric Garcia but also um Artem Dovbik, the the centre forward, um, and again they brought all of these players in and they fitted into the system, and it's it's just the 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 perfect example of what coaching should be about. It's about get yes, getting high level players, but finding systems that that they work in and using those players and those systems to be able to offer solutions on on a football field. Um, I've talked about Girona quite a lot, but let's let's talk a little bit about um, by Leverkusen as well, because Leverkusen are interesting because um, I think that you get that really nice mixture of what we were talking down talking about before, of of position and relation. So with what what you see from um, Xabi Alonso is using position in first few phases of build up because it offers a structure for you to get the ball, you know, around an opposition high press if they're they're going to be pressing high but then once you've got into structured possession or settled possession they're then going to try and look for these channels of players where they can have a quite relational um uh, uh, uh play between between the players in those channels so move the ball quickly through one touch passing by having the players quite close together um and uh, yeah yeah again using these sorts of patterns of uh, of play where you can have one twos or or, or or just strings of one touch passing to get the ball into more dangerous areas as well so that's been really fun to see too and no doubt we will see Xabi Alonso coaching um, one of the big teams in Europe before long so expect to see that that kind of uh, approach to football tactics appearing on a pitch near you as well but quite nice insofar as it's that nice mixture of using positional ideas but having the capacity to use relational stuff as well um, to, to get upside and move the ball through line to pressure really quickly through these channels of players Summarise there, John, I think it's pertinent to bring up um, that player profiles have been as ever, they've seldom been as ever important as they have been now. And it's something which the great Valerie Lebanovsky touched upon years ago when he says about one's arsenal as a football team and he compares it to have many, many different micro models within that arsenal and methods of attack, which I think is so, so fascinating. But as we begin to wrap up a close, John, I suppose we've talked to the depths of tactics here. But uh, what's one thing perhaps I should have asked you about, or perhaps even better, what is one thing that's happening in the world of football tactics now, John, that no one but is speaking about, but we ought to be? Oof. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, I think maybe I'm just too too shuttered, but like the, the stuff that we've been talking about in terms of... Um, and the out of possession focus that that has become so important. Um, I think when it comes to um, when it comes to the history of tactics or the evolution of tactics, um, there is always clear delineations of where it's going to go. It's not always easy to see them, but um, I'm a firm believer that tactical evolution happens in a in a dialectical way. And what I mean by that is that It, it, there is there is a, a trajectory forwards 
um, which is responding to what's gone before. It's almost a conversational element. So as we've said, with hybrid pressing, hybrid pressing poses a problem, which is now being solved um, by by different um, strategies in terms of like deep build up. And that's, I mean, it's understandable, right? You solve problems that emerge. And then the 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 growth to knowledge that we have is um is is built upon those those problems and the solutions we find to them. There's a lot of people who talk about football tactics as being cyclical. I don't like that. That's why I use the word dialectical, which is maybe maybe sounds a little bit more highfalutin and 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 uh, just horrible. But um the reason what what I mean by dialectical is there is that cyclicality there because it is you know, always a response to what's gone before, but it's a spiral that's going upwards because we're progressing as well. We're learning new things about the game that um, that we didn't know before. I think again, maybe maybe to to move back around to the conversation we started off with about positionism versus relationism. In many respects, I think that the the move back towards talking about relation is a is is a small c conservative move. What I mean by that is that a lot of people cite the fact that football used to be more fun in the past and they want to return to that period of football when it was about individual players and there wasn't too much about structures and the boring out of possession stuff um but i think that we can't the, the argument that a lot of relationists make is that we want to return back to that previous time but i would always argue it's impossible to go back to that point because we know too much now and i think the realization is always going to be there if teams were to just just play in this purely relational way without any thought to top-down structure, then you're just going to get taken apart in the modern game. So the relational ideas that are coming back in now are further up the spiral, where we already have the understanding now about what positional play can offer us and what structural play can offer us. If we are to integrate position, uh, relational ideas now, it's with all of that in mind. So that's why I think Javi Alonso is a great example of evolution, because it's not it's not just that he's saying, well, let's go back to at the era before Pep came along and ruined football. He's saying, this has happened. This is a reality. We can't go back now, but we can build on it. Um, and we can take some of these relational ideas into our positional approaches and and use them to our advantage as well. So that's a really long, long winded way of, uh, of answering the question, which is largely prompted by the fact that I didn't have a concise answer for you, but, um, I think that's what, what if we're going to look for what's going to be interesting next in the world of football, we have to look at what is interesting now and think what 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 problems does it pose and what sort of solutions might, might we expect from, from those kind of problems that are being thrown out there. So, yeah, I think that the the, the next move will probably be in. Well, yeah, if, if we're saying that teams are finding ways of being more flexible in terms of being able to deal with hybrid presses then we're going to find out of possession systems probably becoming better adept at um, responding to the, 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 the flexibility that we now need in our, in our build-up structures. So, and, and you know, again, like Pep Guardiola is always the the way to go for, for this, for me, um, because we're, we're, we're already seeing that. I think the, the part of the reason why um, we're seeing hybrid pressing systems failing now is precisely because Pep Guardiola can come along and look at a team like Newcastle, recognize the weaknesses that their their high press can can um, produce when they're pressing high up the pitch, and he can exploit them so, so easily. So Newcastle press with a narrow front three. They leave the opposition fullbacks quite free, and then one the outside uh, centre midfielder on either side will jump up if the, full, if the fullback gets the ball. Now, Pep Guardiola recognizes this. So what he's what he had did when he when he's played against Newcastle this season is he plays with a with a very narrow back three, and then a, a back a, a midfield three in front of them also very narrow, because if you do that, then you you're going to squeeze. You're not only going to squeeze the opposition front line really narrow, but the second line is going to be really narrow as well, and you're now in a situation where you have a problem. How do you mark the full the 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 full back if you've got three players on three in the in the midfield area as well? And he's done that really, really well. By I think he, in the first game they played, where it was a one 0 win, they inverted one of the centre backs, uh, pulled one of the full backs around to make a, a sort of back two with the other centre back, and then they used Kyle Walker going all the way down the line. So you got a free full back, and Phil Foden's in the same channel as him. They're both up against Dan Byrne, but Phil Foden's going to go inside to the space in behind because Newcastle press so high. So you got a lot of space in between the 
central midfield and the back line. Um, they're all pinned by City players, the back three and then the midfield three. There's a lot of space in between. Phil Foden drifts into that space. So now the, the question is for Dan Byrne, do I go with Phil Foden and leave Kyle Walker free in the channel? Or do I stay with Kyle Walker and then there's a free man in between the lines of pressure, which Edison can dink the ball over? Now, that's a very... Uh, it's a very complicated concept to talk about. So if you didn't follow me there, that's fine. But the important point to make is that the reason why Man City played that way is because Pep Guardiola knows exactly what Newcastle are doing out of possession and how to exploit it. And so he sets his system up to be able to do that. Um, so that's why these these sort of high pressing systems are starting to fail because coaches are now just finding solutions because they're, they're predictable, right? Any system that's predictable is exploitable. Um, so I think the next stage is going to be finding ways of of making your high press less predictable because then it's harder to um, to 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 come to terms with. Um, on top of what I've just said before, which is you know, with Ange Postecoglou, if he has a huge amount of rotation in his in his build up unit. How do you find ways of, of making that problematic as well? Um, whether or not those things happen, I don't know. Um, but that's my hunch for where the next steps will be because that's it's just sort of following the logical steps along. This is this is a problem. Here's a solution. So let's cause a problem to the solution. Here's the solution to that problem, et cetera. And it goes on and on and on forever. Yeah. But if we were to use a, an adage from the very, very start, John, you know, if there is to be a glitch in the matrix, how this evolves, we're all yet to be seen. But um, John, I really, really enjoyed doing this with you today. Um, you've been a long requested guest here on the show. I'm sure this is the first of a few conversations that we can have regarding this. But um, as we begin to bring the podcast to a close, what would be the one bit of key advice you'd have for people wishing to thread a similar path to yourself? Uh, I think the most important advice I can give to anyone is always try and avoid the trap of thinking that because you've understood something, that's the way that it will be um, and is. So always be aware of the the, the limits to your knowledge, constantly re return to your priors and, and your beliefs and re-examine them and never fall into the trap of thinking you can never be wrong about things because I think the best analysts are the ones who always are willing to accept that there could be a different way of viewing things. Um, being a good analyst is about being curious. It's not about being right. So if you ever fall into the trap of thinking, I'm going to argue that, and look, I do this all the time. It's it's hard not to, especially when you're a public analyst. It's it's hard not to fall into positions where you want to argue your your original point, despite knowing deep inside that actually it's not a sufficient point, really. Um, so yeah, always be willing to change your mind on things. Always be willing to accept that other people might understand things better than you. Always be willing to to realize that you might misunderstand things and always be willing to return to things with fresh eyes in order to, um, to, to recognize that actually the con the concept of the, 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 the reality of football that is out there, that we're trying to conceptualize is always going to be way bigger than our concept. So the, the concept should always be subsidiary to the reality itself. Um, so yeah, constantly going back to that reality and, and making sure that our ideas fit to it rather than we try and squeeze the reality to our ideas. Thanks for joining me so much today, John. Yeah, it's been great. Thank you so much.